The Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, Literalism. This literalism, <clears throat> where it's where we differ from all the other churches taking this literally. Well, why shouldn't you take it literally? Here we quote Gregor of Nyssen. Now, these are a huge run of the... Uh, well, Gregor of Nyssen puts it this way. If we soar in language and stand above the arch of heaven, we shall find there the supra-celestial earth and also those who gape after sensual enjoyment and ask, shall we have teeth or other members hereafter? The answer is yes, since the scriptures are perfectly clear. We shall have all our members, but we will not make use of them. So you had to have your cake and eat it. They knew the scriptures made it clear that there would be a physical resurrection. And... Uh, so you had to have your eyes, ears, teeth, organs, dimensions, uh, and uh, but you'd never have any use of them because you'd be resurrected. You'd have to be a spiritual being then. This was an awkward answer. Now, Gregor of Nyssen was one of the greatest professors, Jaeger, spent all the last years of his life editing Gregor of Nyssen, who had already been edited uh, by Benedictus Nietzsche. And uh, it's a massive work, which you can't find here. You'll find it in the Patrologia. The, the old edition, the Patrologia, but you, it's never been translated. You won't find it anywhere, so we won't bother about that. Uh, but he was a very important father. And uh, he was interested especially in taliotes, the idea of being initiated. The temple ordinances were an obsession with him. He could never get them out of his system, but he didn't know what they meant. Well, anyway, this is the way he talks about that. And uh, the great John Chrysostom, he is one of the father doctors of the church. There are only eight doctors of the church there. There are three Greek doctors and four Latin doctors, and they're going to give the... They're the ones that really give us the doctors, meaning the teachers, the basic theology of the modern Christian world, Catholic, Protestant, all the rest of them. They're the ones who are constantly cited, for example, in the controversies of the scholastics and also in the controversies of the Reformation. The Reformers refer to them every bit as much. In fact, more so. They use them more than the... Uh, than the... Uh, the priesthood before them in the Middle Ages who were not nearly so learned, you know. But the, uh, these four doctors, they're the four Greek doctors. Notice they don't include some of the great ones like, uh, like uh, Oregon, uh, but they include uh, two brother and two cousins, Gregor of Nazianzus and St. Basil. And then this John Chrysostom is the other. And uh, in the Latin fathers, well, there's John Chrysostom, and uh, who would the other? Well, Athanasius, of course, the Athanasian Creed. He was present at, at Nicaea. He was the one that gave the Christians the Ath Athanasian Creed that tells you that God is three, and yet he is not three. He is one, and yet he is not one. The Father and the Son are the same, yet they're not the same. They're different, yet they're not different. And it's a, it clarifies things beautifully and uh, <laughs> led to hundreds of years of controversy, the Nicene Creed. But uh, So those are the four Greeks and the four Latin ones. Notice they come very close together. Uh, the uh, two of them are cousins, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and, to, and then the Latin fathers even closer together. There's the great St. Augustine, who's the center, but his teacher was Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, who was a rhetorician long before he joined the church, and his rhetoric was all interest in Augustine, but he converted him finally. And uh, then his, his contemporary and friend Jerome, they died just 15, 40, uh, 15 years apart. Jerome spent 15 years, 15 again, in... Uh, in Palestine, lived at, in a monastery at Bethlehem and translated the Bible, the Vulgate, the official Vulgate Catholic Bible. Incidentally, we wouldn't have any Bible at all today. The King James Algo went back to the Vulgate because at the time the King James was made, uh, nobody could read Greek very well. They didn't understand it at all. And Hebrew was almost out of the question. Look how they laughed at, at Scaliger. There were good scholars and so forth, but when, uh, when the great Erasmus tried to supply the missing verse to Mark, there was the last in the in the Beza manuscript, there was one verse missing at the end, and uh, the great uh, Erasmus supplied it by writing what the Greek word would have been. And in that one short verse, he made nine bad grammatical mistakes, which shows you how well they understood the text anyway. No, they all fell back. The, the writers of the our King James Version, which is the most glorious prose work in the English language, uh, leaned heavily on Luther's Bible, and Luther leaned heavily on the Vulgate, on the Latin Bible, because that much they could read. But as far as the text were concerned, no. 
they had late text and so forth. This isn't a class in, in Bible here, but these are the, this is why these people believed these things and why they lost all the stuff we have in the Pearl of Great Price. It's so important. So we have them, uh, and then, then finally you have those three, and then way off in 600, you have Gregory the Great, we mentioned before, who was called Pater Superstitionum because he introduced all sorts of things into the picture that were necessary to fill in the gaps that the loss of the earlier teachings had left. So this John Chrysostom says, and he left us lots of writings, he's a wonderful writer, and uh, he says, how can God have a tangible body? Such a mystery can be viewed only with fear and trembling. We can't understand it. Elsewhere he says he doubts. Well, he, the angels can't understand it. Nobody can. How that's possible? Well, actually, that's Oregon uses that argument. But they never could break away from it because the scriptures wouldn't allow it. Now, Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, he was golden enough. He was the great orator of his time and lived in the beginning, uh, in the fourth and fifth centuries. What the and so that uh, so he asks this he says the old Christians had to have physical miracles and presence those simple minded boobs we don't believe like the early church now they were proud of having advanced from the primitive doctrine and that's why uh, there was another de-eschatologizing of Christianity after World War II because the German Lutheran scholars were very much delusioned by the terrible things that had happened, and so led by Rudolf Bultmann, they said, well, we must de-eschatologize. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, Alfred Schweitzer, in his Leben Jesu, uh, started that. He says, after all, they were primitive people. They didn't know A from B. Uh, we have to get rid of the superstitious part of the Bible, the miracles, and the idea that Christ is the Son of God and all that. It was a, he was a great teacher, a moral teacher, and that was as far as you could go. And so you had the de-eschatologizing, taking the, all, the, all the supernatural element out of religion and what you have left. But then in the 60s, they, they did it in the 50s and 60s, especially the 60s, they, they had this reaction along with the Ecumenical Council. How can we say we're Christians if we don't believe what the early Christians believed? You call yourself anything you want, but don't call yourself a Christian because you say those people were crazy. They didn't know what was what. But already you have that in writers like Jerome, and, and very strong, remember we talked about the last time, he talks about the old-fashioned Christians. Well, so he says, how about these things? We can't go along with the old Christians. They had to have physical miracles and presences. Those simple souls lack the... Now, incidentally, you will not find translations of John Chrysostom either. Too bad. You will find him. We have him in the Patrologia here. In fact, we have two copies. Of, see, there's a Patrologia. That is, the writings of the fathers in all their chronological order have been collected. Two different editions. And uh, he has many volumes, 17 volumes in it. It's a massive work, and you can find out all sorts of things. See, do you realize the 4th century is far better, is far better documented than the 14th century, or, or even than the 19th century, as far as that goes in church history? It's marvelously done. We had everything that went on then. At this time when the church was lost, when Constantine took over, in the, uh, the fourth century library is tremendous. You've got all their personal letters and reflections here. Oh, see, Eusebius, uh, in his table talk with the Empress to Constantine, Constantine explaining to him what he has in mind, just like some intimate, in-depth reporter for a TV, commercial, TV uh, documentary or something like that. We've got all these notes from the early church at this time of transition. What value? And nobody ever reads them. Why not? Well, because the church was set on its way. Its pattern is established. No minister ever looks at these or even knows of their existence. It's very puzzling. It's rather embarrassing to talk to them. But, uh, but why should we? You see, why should we go? This has all been settled now. We have our creeds, and, of course, the, the concern of any minister or pastor is, is with his flock and the duties he has to carry out as far as going into the fine points of doctrine is concerned. So you can imagine when Joseph Smith came along with all this, uh, literally he had actually seen the Father and the Son. Imagine what a shock that would be. What a tremendous cultural shock. If he wanted to say the worst thing he possible could, possibly could, that was it. So John Chrysostom tells us here, he, uh, he repeatedly invites the members to see the angels and martyrs in their midst with the eyes of their intellect. Don't expect that angels and martyrs were real people. Then he said the older Christians had to have that sort of thing. Those simple souls lack the ennoia of the incorporeal gifts, the ennoia, the intellectual capacity for to enjoy the incorporeal uh, gifts, the non-material gifts. They had to have miracles because 
unlike us, they had not learned to see with the mind and faith alone, just as if the Christians of the 5th century had learned an improvement on the days of the apostles. They actually speak patronizingly of the apostles. You know, they didn't understand these things. We go to school, we understand these things. And uh, then here is a very frank statement. If we no longer have revelation, we have something better. And what do you think is better than revelation? You see, we've got away from that old physical stuff to a spiritual realm. We have something better than revelation. He says, now, we have the bones and relics of the martyrs. Talk about going back to the physical, to the tangible. Only this time, they're not even alive. There's just a lot of dead, dead rubble here. As you've seen, as you can see them by the thousands around the Mediterranean, these, these dried widowed, uh, withered bones, rather hideous sort of thing. But that's far better than revelation, he says, to have those bones which the demons fear. <coughs> he, uses a, <laughs> he uses an argument for the fact that we still have the, the Holy Ghost in the church, though, because he says, when I go into a big church very late at night and it's dark, I sort of get scared. Because that proves there's a Holy Ghost. <laughs> because there is a spiritual experience. I have a thrill of the spirit here. He says, uh, the demons in any city that contains the bones of the saints is absolutely impregnable. Of course, they believed that until the city started falling before the Moslems, like, like moths before the flame. And this from a man who holds physical things in utter loathing, you see. The church is all, he says, because it does not exist physically, but in the spirit. Heavenly things being incorporeal are seen only in the intellect, to logismo. The Lord is near. He is here, but never visibly. That is not what is meant by the coming of the Lord or his appearance. See, they gave up, they call that chiliasm. Remember the thousand years reign, the Greek word for thousand is chilia. And chiliasm is the belief that the Lord would come and reign for a thousand years. And they believed it in the early church, and then it became a heresy, and uh, 400,000 Donatists in North Africa were put to death because they believed in it with the approval and by the recommendation of the great St. Augustine, who himself was an African. He was the Bishop of Hippo. And uh, these Donatists were teaching the wrong thing, so we should get rid of them. So they actually went out. The, emperor, the emperor's troops went out, urged on by Augustine, and slaughtered 400,000 of them uh, for believing that Christ would come again. <laughs> it's a strange procedure, isn't it? And if you, if you want your references, this is in the 60th volume of the Patrologia, the 26th column here. Uh, but never visibly, that is not what is meant by his coming. After the resurrection, the apostles no longer asked the Lord what would be the sign of his coming or the end of the world. They knew he had already arrived, and he would not answer save by promising the Holy Ghost. He would never come again. Well, he goes on like this, and, uh, and then Nicephorus uh, and Gregory the Great. Uh, Nicephorus comes in between, and Gregory the Great is the last of the, the latest of the church, of the doctors of the church, one of the great doctors. They want it both ways. They say, since there's no such thing as a bodiless body or an imageless image, and Christ has an image, we talk about the body of Christ, and we talk about the image, man in God's image. Christ, we're quoting again, this is from the 79th volume of the Patrologia, in case you want to know, and 144th column. There is no such thing as a bodiless body or an imageless image. What's the solution? Christ must still have a body but one having nothing in common with what we can possibly imagine as a body. St. Neilis says the same thing. And the Venerable Bede, who was the great, uh, he died on, on my birthday, no coincidence at all, in the year three, 735, very early in England, and he was one of the greatest of all the fathers. Uh, he, he was English all his days. And uh, he wrote there, he was writing, the, he was finishing his Gospel of John as he expired the famous, write it quickly, write it quickly, trying to get to the last verse. Quick, do I still have any time? Write it quickly. And he finally finished his Gospel of John. He was a wonderful man, though. Uh, but he says it was to teach the apostles. He appeared to them in a palpable body and ate with them. To teach them what? That he had no body, but was a spirit. If you follow that line of argument, he came with them. He asked for food to eat. He bought the fish. He cooked the fish on the fire and so forth. And he ate with them. And... Uh, Whenever he appeared after the resurrection, he had to ask for food and ate with them, and he said, A body has not flesh and bone, as you see me have. That was to teach them that he had no body of flesh and bone, but was a spirit. Well, with this kind of logic, we don't want to be slowed down on this too long. Um, he 
Yes, the well still. And then this passage we read from him. Well, this is what Wood is talking about Christianity today. Now we we'll skip down. To, do they still follow this crazy line of argument? Well, <coughs> a recent article by Butler in the Titrister uh, Testament and Submission Job says the uh, allegory with a self-congratulating pleasure of thought manipulation, the games which become ideas, which become a mechanical idea of verbal inspiration. You see, by using words and learning phrases, that's the equivalent of inspiration. He said, quote, a mechanical idea of verbal inspiration. To be wrapped away from matter, that is the lodging of the, a longing of the Christian Greek. It is St. Ambrose's cup of the spirit, which from heaven is held out to the earth. Now, there are two brothers, Hugo Runner, uh, and uh, what's his name, Runner? I'll be thinking of it in a minute. Uh, they say that the longing of the Christian is to be wrapped away from matter, to be taken away from matter. They still cling to that. They are the two most eminent, especially this uh, Hugo Runner here, are uh, the most uh, eminent Catholic theologians today. And they say the main object and desire of being a Christian is that you won't be contaminated or concerned with matter at all, with the physical universe. Well, uh, and Arnold Lunn, who in the 1930s was the stoutest defender of the Roman Catholic theology, says is uh, Thomas Aquinas. He says, Thomas Aquinas, starting from the universally admitted truth that it is certain that, and obvious to our senses that some things are in motion, proceeds to deduce the existence of God. This is a fact. Something is in motion. Is there nothing literal in that? Well, then he says, if one resorts to the easy, self-contradictory expedient of denying the manifold of finite things has any existence, as Lovejoy writes, all problems disappear at a stroke. If we say that, we make it just allegory, we get nowhere. Uh, but he quotes, uh, oh yes, here is uh, Arnold Dunn. He cites Jerome's remark that the idea of God sitting on a throne is superstitious nonsense. Now, again, you see we're talking about Thomas Aquinas. If Augustine is the greatest, Thomas Aquinas is the greatest medieval philosopher. As you know that, Thomas and he says, uh, is superstitious nonsense. Yet his own blessed assurance is Aquinas starting out from universally admitted truth that if certain is obvious to our senses things most, then God exists. He proves the existence of God purely logically by the fact that things move. Arnold Lund entitled his big work The Revolt from Reason, that everybody but the, the, uh, that everybody but the uh, scholastic philosophers of the Middle Ages uh, had no theology and no religion at all because they revolted from reason in wanting to talk about a, a physical God, physical heaven, and things like that. That was a revolt from reason of which there are never two. The idea of, the, of God in heaven is superstitious nonsense. Well, uh, but now these things have changed now. Uh, scholars at the beginning of this century, we read in a recent expository times, that's the official... Uh, that's the official uh, document of the, of the Episcopal Church in England. Uh, incidentally, I, I had a long con some conversations with I.E.S. Edwards yesterday. He has a thing that impresses him so much, uh, being here, aside from the fact that he couldn't get coffee in the cafeteria, was <laughs> that uh, uh, you people seem to take uh, your religion much more seriously than, than the Anglicans do. My answer was, everybody takes religion more seriously than the Anglicans. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even, that's not considered self-respecting to take it too seriously with them. <laughs> but he's a great man. Uh, so the, uh, at the beginning of the century, scholars began devoting themselves to the rediscovery of the Jesus of history, who had nothing of the supernatural about him, we're told. This is this article. And this started out with the, uh, especially with Alfred Schweitzer. Ten years later, it had been not only abandoned, but discarded with contempt, only to return 20 years after that. With the doctrine we have today, the materials in the Gospels have survived only as expressions of faith, not as historical data. Jesus has become a mere saving event. He has ceased to be a person. And uh, besides Rudolf Bultmann, it was a choice between that and the common view that Jesus was a teacher of ethics who represented the highest level then reached by Judaism that later Christology is mainly the work of Paul. It doesn't go back to Jesus at all. So we get these things that set us apart and so forth back to Bolton and the rest. Reinhold Niebuhr, I have so many friends who are devoted to Reinhold Niebuhr, he says, 
The biblical eschatology, the miraculous part of the Bible, the supernatural, the hereafter, and so forth, must be taken seriously, but not literally. You don't take it literally, see, but you take it seriously. Right? You take, if you don't take it literally, you don't take it seriously, as, as Aristides said. It was like, uh, like Yadin, Yagiel, or Yadin, who was, the, who was the commander in the Israeli war in 1948, you know, when it was the 60s war. And uh, he was here, and we was down at uh, Kent Brown's house, and we talked all night with uh, Yadil Yagin who was the editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as you know, he, his father discovered them, as a matter of fact, his father was a Koenig. And, but he, he was the editor, and he died recently, but he was the commander of the Israeli forces at that time. And uh, he says, uh, we in, in Israel, we uh, don't believe in miracles, but we trust them. <laughs> we count on them, well, that's his word. We don't believe in miracles, but we count on them. He never could have got through these wars, he said, if it hadn't been for miracles. So we don't believe on them, we count on them. <laughs> well, the, uh, <coughs> this is a, uh, the doctrine of Ian Dahl. Now, Dahl was, here, Dahl was the one who, uh, he was a Danish scholar who collected all this stuff, the biggest collection of writings on, single writings on early Christianity and so forth. He reaches the conclusion that uh, the uh, heterosomatism, it's a real body that rises in the resurrection, but that Christ had, but not the same body that we have here. And then Dahl says, this assumes that the mind of modern man is more likely to have the right insight into truth and reality than that of his ancient forebears. That's the basic thesis. Modern man with his education surely knows more than most people knew. But about these things, um, how, finally, now this Sogan, he's done uh, lots of work. He's a Christian archaeologist and very active, and he says, uh, he says, why not uh, call a spade a spade? There's those today who will go right back to the old literalism. He says, the story of salvation only exists when we are dealing with reality, not with later artificial workings over. As Hesse says, only that interests us which actually happened. Everything else, not at all or incidentally, doesn't interest us at all if it, if it didn't actually happen, which is exactly what Aristides says at the beginning. And uh, E.C. Russ says, we must still hold to a historical, bodily, and even physical resurrection without being crudely material. Now, there you are. Again, we want to believe in the physical resurrection, but not crudely material, nothing like that. Don't eat. How you do that? Mind us at bottom in the seventh, in, in the, uh, in the Midsummer Night's Dream, you know. <coughs> he's not supposed, he's going to roar as the lion, he's going to take the lion's part, but he'll frighten the ladies if with his terrible roar. He says, no, I'll be careful not to frighten the ladies. I will roar as gently as any sucking dove. <coughs> <coughs> Same thing here. We don't want to be too material, but we must be material about it. <coughs> or as St. Augustine says about infant damnation, which is one of the four things he just couldn't get in his, stuck in his craw. He could never get it out, never explain it, but it had to be because these children weren't baptized, so they had to be damned. He says they'll be damned, they'll be damned, they'll be damned all the way, but with a light damnation. <laughs> they have to have it both ways. <laughs> well, now, with this, if we... If we recognize this literalism, this takes us to this very, uh, this very important, this basic doctrine here of uh, a pre-existence in which there's an awful lot. And uh, we see how it comes out. The pre-existence comes out if we accept the, uh, a literal existence. We don't believe in creation out of nothing. Well, that's the later. Uh, this, this idea, this emphasis on pre-existence is seemingly redundant repetition is driving home the realization that knowing who we really are is the only thing that can put everything into its proper portion perspective. And of course, it's a big thing in the Pearl of Great Price. The key to understanding knowledge is that we are eternally spiritual. Now, how did the early church teach? What did they teach about that? Uh, two sections here. The Egyptians were, were great on it as far as that goes, but let me just follow through these. Well, as, as Jonah says, the basic teaching which we find in the Proverbs of Solomon, the speaker was in the presence of God before the foundation of the earth, is found among the Egyptians, and you see a lot of it there. Now here, and I'm not going to slow down on this, but uh, uh, in the earliest texts, which are the pyramid texts, we talked about the oldest book in the world. We didn't know that. In another class, that was a Shabako stone. 
Uh, but the oldest books in the world are the pyramid texts. They're huge. We have, and incidentally, as Professor Edwards tells me, remember, he is the authority on the pyramids. He wrote the standard work on the pyramids. He's here now. And uh, they're, uh, they're working on the pyramids of the 5th and 6th dynasty now, and they're discovering new pyramid texts every day. We have thousands of them. I mean, this is all back from before 2400 B.C. They're in, the, in the old pyramids, this comes from. This comes from the old kingdom. This is what they believed way back there. And they're the oldest document in the world, but it isn't just a few scratches here and there, a few fragments. It's a, it's a library. You bring it in, you can stagger under it. But uh, in the pyramid text, then, we read this, for example. Um, the Pharaoh was conceived by his father when there was as yet no heaven, nor earth, nor people, nor birth of the gods, nor were there any dead. And every individual existed when the plan of the ancient Lord of Heaven was not yet formulated. It speaks of the primordial mother and how one came, one, the one became three, how before all that, <clears throat> before all that we were together in his presence. My name is the son of the primordial God, says these are on the, from the coffins, uh, the pyramid text go right over into the coffin text without a break here. And, uh, which are even more numerous. I existed before I was born, when the gods did not exist, when there was as yet no bird trap, when the cattle had not were not yet lassoed and so forth. I was formerly, I was of yesterday, a great one among the great and noble ones. Uh, the ordinary person puts this, well, this is nobility here, on his coffin. Of course, this thinks of Abraham 3.23. Uh, these are my... Uh, he saw that there were many that were great and noble. And uh, thou wert one of them. Abraham, thou wert one of them. Lord tells him there are many that were great. Well, you get this all through the Egyptian stuff. Uh, and here's a coffin text. Before I was born by hand or born of woman, he created me in the midst of his perfection, which caused to jubilate those who shared in the secrets. When we were created in the pre-existence, remember, remember, the morning stars shouted for joy, the sons of God shouted for joy, all the morning stars sang together. That's the creation hymn. And it's often referred to in these, in these writings, the very ancient. The thing most often they referred to in, in early writings is this creation hymn, the hymn of joy that was sung uh, at the creation to celebrate the plan which was now accepted and was now beginning to be operative. And uh, we were there. Uh, they refer to that a lot. There's a great deal of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the fact that this is in the very earliest Egyptian stuff is interesting. Now, uh, and there's the Clementine recognitions. Now, we mentioned them before. When Peter is explaining uh, the gospel to Clement for the first time, he tells about the plan, which he of his own good pleasure announced in the presence of all the first angels which were assembled before him. Last of all, he made man, whose real nature, however, is older, and for, the, and for whose sake all this was created. It's the pre-existent man. Moses. A51 says, I made the world and men before they were in the flesh. And so we have many passages of this from the earlier writings. Uh, go, go back to our Clementine recognitions. That's the one we brought along the last time. He says, this world was made so that the number of spirits predestined to come here when their number was full could receive their bodies and again be conducted back to the light. So as <laughs> they were conducted back after they'd finished their testing here, they must have been there before. And... Uh, Yes, uh, the pastor of Hermas, <coughs> that's very early, uh, teaches, this is one of the seven apostolic fathers, the earliest of all we mentioned before. Uh, this was discovered at the end of the 19th century. It teaches that the Christians should so live to be ready to renounce the prince of this world at any time and betake himself back to the Lord, the Lord having sworn by his glory, a super electus suus, that after a certain set day of salvation on this earth, Salvation would be impossible, and you have to behave yourself now. I'm going to read from the Odes of Solomon, and we'll let this do for the, for the early Christian stuff. The Odes of Solomon were discovered in 1906 by Rendell Harris, and uh, way up east of the Tigris, way up almost in Central Asia there, a long ways off in there, the earliest Christian hymn. They go right back to the beginning and refer us to, to the Dead Sea Scrolls. You get these people wandering back there from Palestine. They go down, they become Mandeans down to the south of the mouth of the river there. Uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. But it was back there, and there were the hymns of Solomon and the odes of Solomon. And now they're checked against early Hebrew and early Christian writings, and they're the oldest and the best. Not only that, it's a gorgeously, a beautifully lyrical hymn, the odes and, uh, of Solomon. Uh, and the, 
the Psalms of Solomon. Now, the Odes of Solomon that deal with the with the temple ceremony and so forth, <laughs> I included a long a translation of them. They're in Syriac, incidentally, in the back of a book of mine in the back. The best thing about it is the back, see. Uh, I may be a terrible compiler, but I do supply you with a lot of stuff that you can't get everywhere, uh, digging this up, other people. And this is uh, that book called The Egyptian Endowment, or uh, The uh, Message of the Joseph Smith Papyrus. I noticed today there are four copies still on the shelf, and uh, there are some on reserve, so that's easy to get off. But uh, don't pay attention to what I say, but look in the back, and there's an appendix with uh, five or six parallel showing that what the Egyptians did in their temples is exactly what the early Christians, the Jews did, according to these documents. And there you will find the Odes of Solomon. And this is from it. I don't think this was quoted in this, though. Peace was prepared for you before ever your conflict, your testing was upon this earth. For I know them, and before they came into being, I took knowledge of them, and on their faces I set my seal. Who is there that is not subject to them? They are mine, and they are mine. He's talking about the the church about Israel. Uh, they are mine, and by my own right hand I set my elect ones. All things, all that have seen me, another passage here, all that have seen me were amazed, and I was regarded them by them as a strange person. He who brought me up is the most high in all his perfection. He who brought me down from on high also brought me up from below. Grace of the elect, and who shall receive it save those who trust it from the beginning? The love of the elect, and who shall put it on except those who possessed it in the beginning? And then they tried to slay me, but I did not perish, because I was not their brother, nor was my birth like theirs. For I was older than they could remember. In vain they attacked me. They thought to destroy the memorial of him who was before them. And while I praised among the praising ones, I was great among the mighty ones. For according to the greatness of the Most High, so he made me in his own likeness, and in his own newness he renewed me and he anointed me from his own perfection. Hallelujah. All who see me will be astonished, for from another world, from another race am I. And, uh, and then chapter 41 is the creation hymn, Hailing the Messiah. And he compares him, uh, well, you compare it with early Christian liturgy from the 18th volume of the Patrologia. We have the Oriental Patrologia, too, which is very valuable, in which the congregation identifies itself with pre-existent design. And the Sophia Christian, all spirits are ageless and equal as to creation, but differ in degrees of power. See, the fact that uh, one person is as old as another, one spirit, doesn't mean that one is, can't be greater than another. And that's a very interesting thing that's explained in the Pearl of Great Price when, when we get to that. You think it isn't fair. One person, he came first. No, nobody came first. Intelligence never was created, neither can be. Man also was in the beginning with God. Then why is God so much greater and so forth? Well, that's a problem, a very interesting problem in the Pearl of Great Price. But in the Gospel of Truth, these are all recent and very old and very recent findings. I've been quoting here from the Sophia Christi and the Gospel of in the Gospel of Truth. One's true name is that given to him by the Father in the pre-existence. That's the name by which you'll be known when you go back. How can anyone understand whose name was not called out in the beginning? He who remains ignorant to the end is a plasma of forgetting and will pass away with it. Uh, well, and here is the doctrine of, of anamnesis, too. If anybody has the, the true knowledge, the notice, it is certain that he is from above, because when he is called, he hears, and he understands, and he answers, and he turns toward the one who calls him. There's this recognition. You, see. you recognize the voice of the Father uh, if, if you are righteous, and so forth. This is a Platonic doctrine of anamnesis. Again, we don't want to get sidetracked. A wonderful passage from the Gospel of Thomas. It says, all the all the sufferings you have to go through in the church, and so forth, all the beatings you have to take. And this you've also find in the Hodea scroll, the very same thing, that meaning the, hang, the Thanksgiving scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have to suffer a lot, but when you know, when you are, get a chance to know what you were before and how much is at stake, you would look upon this with nothing but rejoicing. It's your big chance, and you would, wouldn't miss it. So glad to come here. And this, the Gospel of Thomas from 80, it says, when you come to know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will know that you are the sons of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you are in poverty. And Jesus says in this same writing, Blessed is he who was before he came into being, and uh, blessed are the solitary elect, for you shall find the kingdom because you came from it. You shall go there again. Jesus said, if I, incidentally, this is the Gospel of Thomas, which contains sayings of Jesus. 
uh, an agrifer that are not in the Bible. And all churches, Protestant and Catholic, have accepted at least 14 of these sayings as authentic. These are original, authentic sayings of Jesus that were lost. And now they are found. And in the latest uh, revised standard translation of the Bible, they are included. So go to the Gospel of Thomas to find out what they used to believe. You say these things got lost, and the evidence is that the uh, that they're showing up now. And this you can get. You can get it at the bookstore, as a matter of fact. They're, you might be able to get it in paperback. It used to be quite cheap. The Gospel of Thomas from Nakamadi. Well, you know, Thomas. This is from a congregation of the early church in Egypt before the apostasy hit them. Yes, the Gospel of Thomas, and that's what we're quoting from now. Oh, when, uh, 20 years ago, it's hard to believe it's so long now, we discovered in, in the 50s, uh, well, it, does, it came out at, in 1949-50. caused an immense sensation. I guess most of you can't remember it. But it was nothing but Gospel of Thomas, and it was as big news as the King Tut. It was in the newspapers every day. Go back and look in Time, Life, and Fortune, you see nothing else but Gospel of Thomas. That was a big thing. But, but they dropped these in the same way you find an interesting article by John Allegro, who uh, was one of the most uh, insightful students of the, of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. He lost his job at, uh, at Harvard for this article that was in the Atlantic Monthly some years ago. He said, well, I'll tell you exactly when it was, because it was in 1960. The scrolls were discovered right at the end of the 1940s and 1950s. There was a big excitement about them, and then all of a sudden, nothing. They were suppressed. Were they actually suppressed? Yes, they were suppressed, and that's what Allegro shows in this article. The Jews don't like them, the Christians don't like them. Nobody likes them because it isn't what they've been teaching. For the Jews, it's much too Christian. You don't have Jews uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the sacrament and the and presidency <coughs> of three and twelve apostles before the time of Christ. What are you doing there? That's what Professor Cross, who incidentally has lectured here a good deal, uh, what Professor Cross calls the, uh, at Harvard, calls the Church of Anticipation. It's as if the whole Christian church was there ahead of time. Well, that's the Book of Mormon. You get it. That's, that is the religion. And the Jews, on the other hand, were offended to find out that there was so much Christianity in Judaism, and the Christians were offended to find out that the Jews were doing these things before Christ came. And it robbed, especially the Catholics were offended, because it says it robbed them of their originality. Christ had to be original. He had to bring something that wasn't known before. Well, Christ, uh, Christ fulfills the prophets and brings more. In the Book of Mormon is when you find that beautiful blending of the two. And so we have in the Gospel of Thomas, he's preaching and preaches very interesting, all sorts of things that we, we don't like today. So uh, when you come to know yourselves, then you will be known and you will know that you are the sons of the living poverty, not you in poverty. And then he says down here, blessed are the solitary and elect. You shall find the kingdom because you came from it. And Jesus said, if they say to you, from where do you have your origin, say to them, this is one of the sayings, the, the agrifer, the unwritten sayings of Jesus, the Logoi. We have come from the light where the light has originated through itself. It stood and revealed itself in their image. Lord, do I and man belong to the material world? The answer is you and your children belong to the Father who existed from the beginning. Your spirit came down from above from the imperishable light. For this reason, the lower powers cannot approach you. But all who have known this road are immortal amidst mortal men, he's saying. You know, know this, and then you have this satisfaction. And the Gospel of Philip, which is equally old and equally important from the point of view of the temple, is very important. The Lord said, Blessed is he who came before he came into being, for he who is both and was shall be. He was and is now, and he shall be. Blessed he who was, who is before he came into being. Uh, it continues, the exalted nature of man is not revealed, but in secret to those who have been initiated and who know. This is an important thing, you see. Every time all these new writings have turned up, they almost, so many of them begin with the title, The Secret Teachings of the Lord to the Apostles After the Resurrection. He taught them secretly after the resurrection, so they, um, they didn't divulge these. They were not shouted from the housetops, as the, the Jesuits insist. They, See, the Christian world can't admit that there had been any secret teachings, let alone any lost teachings, because if there were, where are they now? Whatever happened to them? Now they admit, of course, that there was a great deal, and now it's possibly turning up. They tell us it's turning up. Uh, 
This is, oh, the gospel of Philip again. Oh, this is the Kabbalistic teaching. The council in heaven, as a council in heaven, every spirit appeared before God in the very same form they were later to take in the human body. God examined them one by one, and many hesitated to come here and to be exposed to, co uh, to contamination. They knew it would be a hard life, and they didn't want to risk the test. They didn't felt, feel good about it, and there's a great deal about that, incidentally. The, uh, got some good ones here. In the second Enoch, the book of Enoch, I, I recently had the occasion two weeks ago to go through, twice, to go through the old Slavonic text. It was a very good uh, refresher course for me. And it says this, Enoch says, Write all the souls of men, how, remember Enoch was the great scribe, write all the souls of men, however many of them are born, for all souls are prepared to eternity before the foundation of the world. And R.H. Charles commenting on this, R.H. Charles you will find on reserve here. He's the one that gets together all of these uh, that were before were known before the Dead Sea Scrolls and Dr. Matty and so forth. But now, as to 1912 was when he got them together. They're still the standard collection of Old Testament apocryphal writings. And you have them here, and they're on reserve. R.H. Charles, uh, apocrypha and pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament. So if you have any questions, look up about the Old Testament, look up R.H. Charles. It's the big, volume two, it's the big Oxford version, big thing. And there you can find it. But uh, he comments on that, and he says, The Platonic doctrine of pre-existence of souls is here taught. We find that it already had made its way into Jewish thought in Egypt. So through Egypt, Christians and Jews, he said, both adopted this, but the fact is they had it independently. They didn't get it from the Jews, though, as we saw, it was a, an Egyptian doctrine. The doctrine was accepted and further, further developed by Philo. Remember, we mentioned Philo before. Philo was the one that shows how the Jews lost literalism. Philo turned everything into uh, the abstractions of the schools. And Josephus says it was an Essene doctrine. In other words, it would, be, it would belong to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were unknown at the time this was written. Uh, the idea being that spirits are immortal and endure forever and ever. Man is a spiritual, eternal being without beginning or end. And he gives a number of examples here. Uh, and uh, he says it became the prevailing doctrine in later Judaism, the doctrine of, of pre-existence here, until, until modern normative Judaism got rid of it. You'll find it in the Bereshit Rabban, you'll find it in the Tankum, and so forth. The doctrine of pre-existence was taught by the, episode, uh, by the Essenes, by Philo, the Talmud, and the Kabbalah, says Meyer, talking about that. Uh, and the Apocalypse of Baruch, which is a, a very valuable one. This goes way back. Uh, you will find that, incidentally, in R.H. Charles. I do believe, yes, he has both Baruch and Ezra there. He says, The multitude of those who should be born was numbered, and for that number a place was prepared where the living might dwell. Right, go to Adam and so forth. And this is another view. What do we here for then? And our coming down here... Was it a fall or was it a calamity? Well, that was the most it got, of course, that we we're here in a prison. Uh, we're being punished. Man's descent from heaven at the moment of conception with his human form and defined seal showing that he had existed before. But unlike Oregon and the Gnostic schools, the Kabbalah does not regard the, the life as a fall or an exile, but as a means of education and a beneficial trial. In other words, as Levi says, our time here became a time of probation. Now, that's what the Kabbalah teaches, I'll tell you what the Kabbalah was later. But Oregon and the Gnostics, was the Christians went off in this direction, that it is a fall, it's an imprisonment, it's a curse. Well, just like Adam brought the curse of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose bitter taste brought death into the world and all our woes in heavenly rooms. It was utter calamity that brought us here. No, the Jewish teaching is, that was not so. It's a benefit, a time of education, a time of learning, and a time of testing. And, uh, so in the book of Abraham, of course, we read, we will make an earth whereon these may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all the things whatsoever we shall command them. They who keep their first estates will be added upon, and so forth, in the third chapter of, of uh, in the third chapter of Abraham. Now here's another book we, we're going to cite, and this is from the Zohar. And the Zohar is a very important writing that's been neglected by the Jews. Again, it, they come back to it, they realize they used to think it was just an invention. It was been invented by Moses of Leon. In, in the 13th century, uh, 1240, 
and uh, it is uh, a work of the Middle Ages, but now they know it's very old, uh, the Zohar, and it comes back. And it's come out in a number of editions. I have a beautiful, complete Hebrew edition just came out of the Zohar. And this is supposed to be the teachings of... It's full of... Not just the biblical teachings, but it's, it's uh, things that might have been in the Bible. Remember, the canon of the Bible is a very arbitrary sort of thing. Many things are in there that shouldn't be. Many things are left out that should be. But uh, the, the Zohar tells us here, <coughs> the... Uh, all men before they lived on earth were present in heaven in the identical form they possess in this life. And everything they learn on earth, they knew already before they came to this world. That's an interesting thing. How could you be tested if you knew it already? This becomes a very interesting problem in physics, as you know, that we come to this, the arrow of time and so forth. Uh, and according to the Talmud, this world is only a marshalling area, so a sort of free port. Uh, I'm stuck with here. While that world above is the true dwelling, we've just come to leave it temporarily to be tested here. All spirits which are to enter into the body exit from the day of creation of the world until the earth shall pass away. Now, a powerful passage in the Zadokite document from the Dead Sea Scrolls tells how God condemned the wicked in the pre-existence by not counting them among those chosen. From of old, from the days of eternity, and before they were established, he knew them and abhorred their generations, with exactitude he set out their names, but those whom he hated he caused to stray. Remember, Satan, again, according to Christ, was a liar from the beginning. But there, uh, then, this expression that is used is another important one, from eternity to eternity. This expression that's used now in the Serex scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, two on the first column on the second page, it uses the expression, me olam le olam, it's more than an ecstatic outbreak from ever to ever. Barnabas uses it, and the Christians use it in his, his epistle 8. Remember, Barnabas is one of these seven, again, is one of the seven apostolic fathers, one of the earliest fathers after the Old Testament, New Testament. And he says, from aeons unto the aeons means that you come out of the aeons and you go into the aeons. You have an eternity behind you. You have an eternity before you. And this is the bottleneck you pass through to determine for a long time to come which way you will take hereafter. Uh, he says, the way of light is the Lord, from aeons into the aeons. The way of life leading from one eternity up Ionon, past another, uh, to the other one to come, which ex eschatology is inconceivable without the photology. Typical of this common background to Jews and early Christians is the prayer of Anna in the Pseudophilo. Hast thou not, O Lord, examined the heart of all generations before thou formest the world? And... Uh, in the Secrets of Enoch, remember Enoch is the scribe and so forth. This is the Slavonic King, it's the very oldest. This is the one very close to the Joseph Smith Enoch. But anyway, it says, uh, the Lord says to Enoch, sit down and write the names of those who are not yet born and the places which are prepared for them forever. For all the spirits were prepared before the foundation of the earth. I swear unto you, my children, that before man was made, that Enoch speaks here, man was in the womb of his mother, he was prepared. And how each should sojourn in this age, that a man might be tested in the balance while he was here. There's your probation, there's your pre-existence too. There has indeed been prepared in advance a place for every human soul. Then the... we we'll go back to our friend Gregor of Nissen again. The soul had a previous existence and a life of its own, where even as in this life it was given its free agency by the Creator, and such as grew weary in doing good entered this life at a disadvantage, having passed the test less satisfactorily than others. Now, this is a writing which is accepted by Oregon, the earliest Christian theologian, and he says, this is what the brethren taught. I don't believe it, but the brethren in the early taught. Now, the fact is, when we're born into this world, it's with unequal advantages, isn't it? Some are born even blind and lame and crippled and all this sort of thing. It's terrible. Some are born into poverty, some into riches. He says, how does that happen? He says, they used to teach that before we came here, life was a test, too. And when we passed the test, we came into this world, and our life here is a reward. We're being rewarded for the things, for, the, for our performance before we came here. He says that would ex certainly explain the inequality of people being born, or as Gregor of Nyssen says here, uh, the soul had a previous existence, or even as in this life, it was a free agency by the Creator, so, because there was a vote in heaven, remember? There was a council in heaven, and they voted, and some preferred not this, and some preferred that. You're perfectly free to take your way there. You had your free agency. 
And such as grew weary in doing good entered this life as a disadvantage because they passed the test all right, but less satisfactorily than others passed it. Well, there's an interesting uh, thesis that, that Oregon developed, and he would say it was slapped down. Uh, well, Basilides says also, a contemporary, uh, that suffering in this life is punishment for sins in the pre-existence, not by way of denying that there was pre-existence, but by insisting that the opportunity to suffer here, even martyrdom, is rather a reward earned before an opportunity for greater glory. Persecutions are not to punish the saints, but to sanctify them. And then back to Oregon again. The spirit stands for progress, and by definition, evil is refusal to accept progress. This is the principle of apostasy, that you refuse to possess, and when you dug in your heels in the other world, you came here at a lower level. Learn this one thing, wrote Cyril of Jerusalem, that before coming to this cosmos, the spirit did not sin, that we came down sinless here and now, and now we sin by choice. Well, which is it? Are we, is it a matter of sin up there? We had to come down here and take off on flesh, I suppose, to be tested in a particular way. No, it's the level of performance that we're judged on in coming down here. And that's another interesting thing. Where that wonderful passage, you see where the Lord says, one will be more intelligent than another. Don't resent it, because you know perfectly well why you're not more intelligent than you are. You're not hitting on all two right now, you see, as far as that. But see, you only use a thousandth of our potential anyway. So you can't complain that somebody's ahead of you. You might be far, far better than you are. So don't worry about him. Just improve yourself. And of course, this is the gospel of repentance. Well, I see the time's up, and we're still... Uh, you might say bogged down in these fundamentals, but they are fundamentals, and they're the fundamentals which are treated with peculiar uh, address and clarity in the Pearl of Great Price, and as far as I know, nowhere else.